This is a podcast by The Straits Times. Warning. This podcast is an audio documentary of a real crime case which may be troubling and upsetting to certain listeners. This episode specifically covers themes of suicide and details of death and traumatic sexual acts. Listener discretion is advised. If you're tuning in from Singapore, we also have mental well-being and resource helplines in our podcast show notes. Suicide Recruitment Notice I want to die, but I'm terrified of doing it alone. If there's anyone who wants to die together, please send me a direct message. I'm 23, living in Tokyo. It will help if you have a car. Thank you for your follow. Burning charcoal is an option, but how about hanging after getting drowsy on sleeping pills? You'll die comfortably without any pain. Takahiro Shiraishi preyed on suicidal young women who had the desire to die but lacked the courage to end their own lives. Through six accounts on Twitter, which is now known as X, he struck up conversations with them by offering not just empathy, but also a way out of their troubles by pretending to be an expert in hanging. In less than three months, he lured his victims to his home in Sama City, located in Kanagawa, an hour and a half from central Tokyo, where he drunk, raped, robbed, and killed them before chopping up their bodies. All of them held suicidal thoughts, but none actually wanted to die. On Halloween in 2017, police found nine human heads and 240 bones in Shiraishi's 13.5 square meter apartment, which was later dubbed the House of Horrors. Like many Japanese apartments, the unit was tiny, not that much larger than a regular car park lot. Though Shiraishi's was a loft unit with a high ceiling from which he hanged his victims. His motives were sex and money. You're listening to True Crimes of Asia, a special podcast series by The Straits Times. I'm Walter Sim, ST's Japan correspondent. In this episode, we take you to Japan, which despite its low crime rates, has made headlines for terrifyingly violent crimes. Japan is one of the most technologically advanced and connected countries in the world. But this status gave a platform to the serial killer who would later become known as the Twitter Killer. Takahiro Shiraishi, who has been sentenced to death, shocked the nation with his cold-bloodedness in using social media to prey on human weaknesses and insecurities for his own ends. His six Twitter accounts included Hanging Pro I Want to Die Lonely Using B's handles, he interacted with 37 different accounts, met 13 people, and killed 9 of them. He was aged 26 to 27 when he committed the murders. All the victims cannot be named due to a court gag order and were identified in court by alphabets A to I in order of death. Warning. From here on, you will hear snippets of actual messages between the perpetrator and his victims and reenactments of interviews in detention. Listener discretion is advised. For this podcast, we will identify the victims by pseudonyms. The following exchange you will hear is a reenactment of a conversation about suicide between Shiraishi and his final victim. Anonymized as victim I in court 
but whom we shall call Ikuko. Ikuko. Hanging is scary. I would like to die by carbon monoxide poisoning from burning charcoal in a closed room. That is not ideal. There are cases where people gathered to die together. But some of them did not succeed and were arrested. There were some who suffered from heavy side effects. The after effects are scary. In the end, hanging is the best, isn't it? By all accounts, Shirai Shi had an unremarkable childhood. Born into a middle-class family on October 9, 1990, he was a quiet, kind, conscientious boy with mediocre grades, above-average sporting ability, and a severe addiction to video games. But what would lead him down this eventual path? Even his mother did not seem to have an explanation. In a written statement during his court trial in 2020, his mother told the court that her son was someone who wouldn't kill an insect. Things started falling apart when he lost motivation in junior high school. He had few friends and his parents later divorced. But there were possible inklings of the dark compulsions that Shiraishi would later manifest. A primary school classmate told local media that Shiraishi and other friends would play choking games, strangling each other to the age of passing out, all in the name of fun. After failing to enter university, Shiraishi worked odd jobs and became a cashier at a local supermarket. But he quit over low wages, unhappy that university graduates in the same job role could earn more than him. Wanting to make a quick and easy buck, he became a recruiter in the seedy Kabukicho red light district in Tokyo's Shinjuku neighborhood, crawling the streets in hopes of coercing underage girls into prostitution. He started using Twitter to chat them up, developing a flat for whispering sweet nothings and convincing young women to do his bidding. But not everyone was charmed by Shiraishi's manner, and he picked up enemies along the way, both online and in real life. Eventually, someone snitched on Shiraishi and he was arrested for the illegal prostitution of minors. He was given a suspended sentence on May 29, 2017. While this allowed him to remain out of jail, it effectively ended his career in Kabukicho's sex trade. Craving love, but jobless and unwilling to put in the hard work, he cocooned himself in the dark recesses of social media, where he began building up a small following on Twitter. This was also when he began his hunt, baiting vulnerable women who expressed suicidal thoughts and winning their trust by acting as if he was suicidal himself. In one of his Twitter profiles, he introduced himself by saying, I want to help people who are really in pain. Please message me anytime. His goal was to find someone with whom he could live with and leech off without ever having to work. In early August of 2017, he contacted and met up with his first victim, victim A, whom we will call Aoi. She was a 21-year-old who was receiving psychiatric treatment. She had posted about wanting to die. Smitten, Shiraishi went house hunting with Aoi, convincing her to fork out the down payment to rent the lot. 
I use Twitter to search for keywords like I'm tired, I'm lonely, and I want to die. Following accounts of women who muttered such phrases and sent them DMs. It's easier to persuade people who are troubled. It's easier to control them. It's easier to control them. If Aoi had worked and earned money for me, I would have become a full-time house husband and all of this would not have happened. However, Shiraishi soon grew jealous after learning that Aoi had grown friendly with a male acquaintance. The acquaintance, referred to in court as Victim C, but whom we will call Chihei, was an aspiring 20-year-old musician. Aoi and Chihei both struggled with suicidal thoughts and grew close. Shirayashi became worried that Aoi would demand he return the money that he owed her if she were to date Chihei. So he invited her to his home where he suddenly struck her from behind. Getting aroused by her unconscious state, he raped her before killing her. He then took the money she had on her. Days went by without being found out. Riding a high from his first killing, Shiraishi began to think he could get away with murder. You may think it's diabolical, but when I killed the first person, it weighed on my mind for about three days. But once I decided this was a way of making a living, I had no more qualms. I could also satisfy my sexual desires at the same time. During the months when he carried out the killings, Shirayashi almost came close to getting caught when Chihei had been unable to get in touch with Aoi. Chihei confronted Shirayashi about her whereabouts and remarked that he must have already killed her. Worried that Chihei would go to the police, Shirayashi convinced him to meet for a meal at his home. Like Aoi, Chihei was killed and dismembered. He was Shirayashi's only male victim. The other victims were all female and aged between 15 and 26. With each killing, Shirayashi grew increasingly confident. In total, he took the lives of nine people. I only knew the social media handles and not the real names of my subsequent victims. If I had a liking for someone and they seemed to have money, I wouldn't rape her and let her live. I wanted easy money. Like a smooth operator, he would chat up multiple suicidal women at the same time, faking empathy and even his age to win trust and respect. For those whom he convinced to meet in person, he invited them to his home. In their conversations, Shirayashi tried to get a sense of whether they had money. If he thought they were poor, he would rape and kill them on the very day of their meeting. Otherwise, he let them live, hoping to leech off them. Those who did not make the cut became objects to fulfill his sexual desires. He either fed them with his favourite whiskey coke that was spiked with tranquilizers and slipping pills, or choked them until they became unconscious. <laughs> he would then rape them before murdering them and carving up their corpses. If I let them go home alive after raping them, I would be arrested. So, I killed them. I dismembered each corpse at home and buried big parts of the body such as the head under cat litter in ice boxes. The flesh and internal organs were wrapped in a disposable pet pee pad and placed in a Ziploc bag, then wrapped in newspaper and disposed of as garbage. I did so to destroy evidence and avoid being caught. 
he became so adept at manipulating women that after his third victim, he did not bother with the previous steps he took to hide his actions. For example, he would previously get victims to leave a will and throw away their smartphones in the sea to pretend that they had died by drowning. On the day he killed his fourth victim, whom we will call Diana, he was even cohabiting with another woman in his loft, whom he likewise met through Twitter but had allowed to live. He had thought this woman was wealthy, given that she worked in the nightlife industry. Well, she could have called the police, I knew it would be fine. We've known each other for some time and built a feeling of trust, love and mutual dependence. If I got arrested, I believe she knew she would be in trouble too. The woman fled upon seeing Diana's mutilated corpse, but as she arrived, she predicted she did not call the police. By this time, he was so seasoned that he could dispose of a corpse within six hours. Neighbors said there was always an awful smell coming from Shiraishi's unit. While Shiraishi kept his apartment's ventilation fan running 24 hours a day, the stench never went away. I want to do it today. Hachioji Station will be good. How about this afternoon? I only have about 1,000 yen on hand. Do I need to prepare anything? It's okay. I'll prepare everything. That was a conversation between Shiraishi and Ikuko, his final victim. He had set the stage for her death on October 23rd, 2017. She had been living alone at that point, but her brother lodged a missing person's report after he was unable to get in touch with her. On October 26, he managed to log into her Twitter account and read her disturbing exchanges with Shiraishi. He then posted the following message on her Twitter account. I am the brother of the person who owned this account. On October 23, I lost contact with her. Before that, we were in touch every day, but there's been no response since 9am that day. My sister was in contact with a certain user via direct message. This user had previously suggested suicide by hanging, saying that my sister may fail to kill herself by burning charcoal. A woman who had previously interacted with Shiraishi came across the post and contacted the brother, who then alerted the police. With her help, the police set up a sting operation where she met with Shiraishi under the guise of being his next victim. The police tailed him home where he did not put up a fight as he knew his game was up. When asked where Ikuko was, Shiraishi pointed to an ice box by the main door and said, She's in there. She's in there. Shiraishi had amassed a mere 500,000 yen in cash or 5,000 Singapore dollars from his nine victims. He described the figure as regrettably too low. Money had been Shiraishi's motivation in the beginning, but that took a back seat as he discovered other means of gratification. He admitted to getting a high from choking and raping his victims. He even confessed that he found himself unable to ejaculate when he had consensual sex during the months he was committing the murders. During the trial, Shiraishi was unrepentant and defiant. I failed because I got caught. I have no other feelings. I regret getting caught, but I don't regret what I did. If I hadn't been caught, I would have continued forever.
His state-appointed lawyers argued for a lesser charge. They said the murders were consensual, given that the victims had granted tacit approval through the exchanges in their agreement to meet Shiraishi. The prosecutors, however, argued that the crime was premeditated, cruel, and committed to serve his own desires. The details of the case stunned many in Japan. Shiraishi's matter-of-fact tone in court shocked people. The grieving families of those killed were angered by Shiraishi's overt lack of remorse. Many could not even think of forgiving Shiraishi for his crimes. The father of one of the victims told the court, Even now, when I see a woman of my daughter's age, I mistake her for my daughter. This pain will never go away. Give her back to me. Shiraishi himself contradicted his lawyer's arguments, telling the court that none of the victims had consented to their killings. As the judge delivered his verdict, Shiraishi looked bored. Presiding judge Naokuni Yano did not mince his words, saying that Shiraishi had not only murdered the victims, but also trampled on their dignity. With social media usage being so commonplace in society, the case has caused immense shock and anxiety. None of the victims agreed to be killed. The defendant is found to be fully responsible for the premeditated crimes. He was cunning and sly for the sole purpose of self-gratification. This is a wicked crime rarely seen in criminal history for the gross disregard for human life. The corpses are dumped as garbage and their dignity as the deceased trample. Freelance journalist Tetsuya Shibui published a book on the Shiraishi murders. Having interviewed Shiraishi three times in prison, he describes the vicious killer as surprisingly ordinary. So my first impression is that he's a normal young man who you can meet anywhere. That's how it felt. I thought he would have been obsessive, but he was able to talk about anything, like someone you would normally meet. I was surprised. He describes this as the worst incident in over 20 years of reporting. Now, for the bereaved families, they cannot get closure because the corpse is not intact. They cannot say goodbye. This, for the Japanese, is especially painful from the perspective of a victim's dignity. I fear they would have suffered irreparable trauma. The case also underscored the dangers stemming from the increased use and reliance on social media for support and community. Since the late 1990s, the internet has been a tool for suicidal victims to seek out like-minded peers to end their lives together. While suicide rates have fallen, recluses have used social media as a platform to connect. Shiraishi had a cult following and even received marriage proposals. Several women also lamented not being his 10th victim. Sociologist Hiroki Nakamori of Rikyo University studies the psychology of missing persons, people who are so troubled that they want to run away from their problems by disappearing or even killing themselves. I don't think of disappearing as a completely negative thing. Sometimes it is difficult and it is okay to run away from toxic environments. But the problem is that there is not always a benevolent person on the other end. It could be a devil like Shiraishi. Depending on who they meet, their fates can really change 180 degrees. 
っていう。Professor Nakamori notes how social media has been a conduit for mass suicides, and that with each high-profile case comes calls for stronger law enforcement and monitoring. Among the changes following the case, Japan's welfare ministry set up social media counseling programs with avenues on Twitter and messaging app Line. Social media guidelines were also changed, such that operators can be issued takedown notices for suicide recruitment. For those who matter suicidal thoughts, they should be directed to help lines. But there are bound to be limits as to what can be done, and suicidal people are still being baited online. In a more recent case, in September 2022, 29-year-old Yuya Nozaki met a 13-year-old student on social media and talked her into taking her own life. Nozaki. Who facilitated the act by driving her to a bridge and egging her to jump into the river, has been jailed for five and a half years. Rather than directly talking about killing themselves on social media, people could talk in coded language to escape scrutiny, and so this makes it very difficult to sniff out each and every case. For accounts that discuss suicide, Professor Nakamori believes that simply freezing them is not the solution. He says active screening and outreach are needed to proactively deliver timely help. How can people who are hoping to die get the help that they need? It is not a case where just because an incident is stopped from happening, that it can be checked off as a success. Meanwhile, Shiraishi, who turns 33 in October 2023, is in a maximum security prison, waiting for his death sentence to be carried out. Japan gives little advance warning of executions. And Shiraishi will only learn of his fate hours before it takes place. In what many see as poetic justice, he will be killed by hanging. You were listening to the sixth and final episode of True Crimes of Asia, a new and special six-part podcast series started by the Straits Times in 2023. It was narrated by Walter Sim, ST's Japan correspondent. Produced and edited by Eden So and Faiza Sani. And the executive producers are Ernest Lewis and Tan Tan Mei. Once again, if you are tuning in from Singapore. We also have mental well-being and resource helplines in our podcast show notes. If you'd like to read more of Walter Sims' columns on Japan, there's a link in our podcast show notes. Do follow ST's True Crimes of Asia podcast on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. Thanks for listening. For more podcasts by the Straits Times, the Business Times, and Money FM eighty nine point three, you can also download the Audio by SPH app. That's A W E D I O.